Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Hope you and yours are keeping safe and sound, well of mind and of body in these strange, weird times that we're still living in. It's an international break, of course. Interlull week. We're all sitting, hoping and praying and keeping things crossed that our players come back safe and sound from their travels, no injuries, no aches or strains or anything like that. I do suspect, however, there's going to be a little bit of fatigue, you know, because some of these guys are scheduled to play three games in a week. Not just the senior players, like the the under-21 players, uh, Eddie Nketiah and Emil Smith-Rowe, who are away with England under-21s. They've got three games this week. Martin Odegaard, three games with Norway. I mean, he may or may not play in all of them, depending on how serious the, the little injury he got the other day is. But, like, the schedule lends itself to having a, an impact on uh, the clubs and the players when they come back. You know, three games in six days, seven days. It's a lot. And I know the season is condensed, and I know why, and we all know why, but I do wonder if there were things we could have done differently to, uh, you know, to protect the players a little bit more. Because we'll hear from the authorities, from the people that run the game, uh, you know, FIFA and UEFA and all of those things, and they'll say something like, Player welfare is our chief concern. But, you know, we know it's it's not. What was that Stephen King book? Uh, the Running Man. It's a bit like them saying that player welfare is their chief concern. If you don't know what The Running Man is, you could Google it, I guess. But a quick summary is, as far as I can remember off the top of my head, it's set way in the future, in a dystopian future. It's probably like... 2020 when it's set because that seemed far away when he wrote this in the 1980s and everything is terrible and there's pollution and uh, you know the workers are like commodities imagine working for companies where you know they don't even consider you an employee how crazy would that be crazy right that kind of thing couldn't happen. But, you know, in this fictional book, that's exactly what happens. And people are poor and they're desperate. And there is a, a game show called The Running Man. And in order to win the, like, the prize money is huge. It's $10 million or something like that. And to win it, all you have to do is survive 30 days on the run while there are people coming after you to hunt you. So you are basically being hunted on live TV, reality TV, for sport. And basically, everyone is out to kill you. So it's a bit like those guys saying that, you know, contestant welfare is their chief concern. We haven't quite got to the point yet where footballers are being uh, hunted and summarily executed on television by death squads as people text 555 to pick their favorite method of execution. But we're not far away. FIFA, where the footballer becomes the sport. The UEFA Champions League of death. The World Cup of Murder. Look, the point is that, uh, you know, a number of our players are away and they're important players and I hope they don't get knackered. That's all I'm saying. I just hope they do not get broken up into absolute bits because we need them and we still have plenty to play for this season. The Europa League is there. I'm not quite sure what the Premier League can do for us, but we've got to keep going, etc., etc. And after this interlull, it's a straight run all the way between now and the end of the season. So come on, keep fingers crossed, keep everything crossed that these guys, can come back absolutely A-OK -okay, uh, as much as possible and also that all the players we don't like on the teams we hate, uh, you know, get injuries and stuff like that. But I didn't say that out loud, OK? Good. All right. Let's get on with today's show. And I just thought because it's an interlull, we might have a little bit of a, a round table sort of chat with a couple of guys who, who can shoot the Arsenal breeze. First up, you know him from the Arsenal Vision podcast. It's Clive Palmer. Hi, Clive. Hey, mate. How are you? I'm all right. Thank you very much. Uh, happy interlull to you and happy interlull to James Bench from CBS. Hi, James. Hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm all right. Let's start with you, James. And, and we're going to start by talking about the the internationals and the international breaks and the schedule that players are being um, asked to adhere to. I know and we all know why uh, things are the way they are. Um, 
but it seems like a lot to ask of players to play three games in six, seven days, sometimes only six days, uh, and expect them to continue to perform and to, um, you know, to try and maintain a good level of consistent performance. Uh, yeah, I know this is not a concept that we're used to as Arsenal fans often, but, you know, it does exist elsewhere, I, I realise. But, like... <sighs> It's a debate that's gone on for a long time. You know, the, the, the amount of football that players play versus the quality of the, the product that they're supposed to produce. But is there anything that could have been done differently this season to lighten the load a little bit on the players? I, I mean, I think there's, there is quite a bit that could have been done. I think from a, you know, from a club level, I have found the whole experience of the, the Carabao Cup uh, to be utterly perverse, um, it seems. Yeah, it, it seems radically. It just seems to. It seems to keep cropping up whenever you're looking forward to a quiet week. Um, so, you know, five clubs seem to somehow still be in it, even though they should have a million and one other things to do. And I don't think that was necessary. Um, I mean, you could throw this up to big picture. Obviously, this is international week, and we've all started thinking about the World Cup and the fact that next season is going to have a, or, or the season after next, even is going to have a huge schism right down the middle um, for the World Cup and whether something more imaginative could have been done um, with the Euros, with the whole fixture calendar to ease a bit of pressure and to kind of, you know, shunt everything in line for a few years. So, that, you know, and you can you can go back to um, the, the traditional August to, to May season, but you would have thought with a, a 2022 Winter World Cup on the horizon, there might have been a, an opportunity to try some creative things, to try something a bit different. I remember when the WSL um, was about to be formed and, and the, was it the FA, the Women's Premier League beforehand, mm. played a Super Series season or, or whatever it was called and I just fit a small competition in in a short space of time um, before they moved over to something different. And, you know, I, I'm not saying you should have cancelled the whole Premier League, but there could have been a little bit more creativity. I'm... You know, I would I would worry if I were a player because you know this international break. Not only is it three games, it's three really intense World Cup qualifiers, and you know it might be fine for England because mm. some of them are San Marino and Albania. But you know, as we're talking now, the under twenty ones are playing against Switzerland. Emil Smith Rowe's played seventy five minutes. It looks like England are going to lose, and and this is a a tournament game. So you would assume Adi Boothroyd is going to have no choice but to you know ride players like Smith Rowe really hard over the next two group stage games or or he'll lose his job. So that, that this isn't even your standard international break where there's a, a friendly against, a, you know, a middling team where you can take off half your players after 45 minutes and they haven't run that hard anyway. These are really important games, really significant for, for the players, for the countries, for the clubs. It's, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the answer is, but then I'm not paid millions of pounds a year to find the answer. It's clear this isn't the answer. Though. Yeah. Really clear. I think that the millions of pounds a year that these people get paid is to appease and do things for the benefit of the sponsors and the advertisers and all that kind of stuff, far more than the the players themselves. Um, and I, you know, it's only when you mentioned it there that I re realized, not realized, but remembered that the World Cup next season is going to be in the winter. I was thinking, oh, World Cup next summer, blah, blah, blah. And, it, you know, I don't know why that had slipped from my mind, but that, of course, adds another layer of, of complication to things. Clive, I mean, could could even, it wouldn't be applicable to all clubs, but, you know, European competitions, I know the TV rights and the broadcasters and the sponsorships and all of those things play a huge part in, in the decision making. But like, what about something crazy like the knockout stages of the Champions League and the Europa League being single games rather than two leg affairs? Even something like that might might have helped a little bit. I'm, I'm almost smiling listening to you come up with these wonderful suggestions because in the real world of football, self-interest rules like massively and it just like shoots down a sensible idea. I think they I think they did a bit of that last year, didn't they, with one-leggers and it seemed to go down really well. But when, when we're in a situation now where every club's going to lose £100 million, suddenly, well, I'm not too sure about that. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, we just got a massive situation where, you know, people just care about themselves and what's happening. But there is a... A huge pull for an international game versus a club game. We've got situations where we got our 250,000 pound a week striker sleeping on our 
airport floor for a night. Mm. I mean, that that can't continue for too much longer. It, it just won't continue. And what will happen is the club game will internalise, you know, and it'll make sure it looks after itself. We can't have these situations where clubs are investing lots and lots of money in individuals. They've got less of it around. They're going to think, how can I increase my revenues back in? I'm going to change what the Champions League looks like. I'm going to threaten them with a Super League. I'm going to get my money back somehow. And it's just going to it's just going to continue to happen. It's a really, it's a sad situation. Well, we can't really look at the rest of the world and we need to look at ourselves. I mean, we're the only, one of the only few leagues that couldn't get five substitutes in. Yeah. You know? And then you look at something like that, where no one's had many, much pre-season. We just want to save players. There's no transfer market, so many squads are heavy because there's no market to move players on the fringe players. Yet you've got three subs rules. You can't even use your squad. So we can't even sort ourselves out because the managers at the bottom of the league are trying to protect themselves. Self-interest again, driven by money. And I just feel it's it's really sad because I'm, I'm watching these games. I'm, I'm just watching England game. Um, and I'm looking at Smith Rowe like many other Arsenal fans watching that game right now and just making sure that, don't pull up, mate. We really need you. Yeah. <laughs> we're, trying to, we're trying to get to the Champions League. We're going to make £100 million for our club. And, uh, and I'm afraid we've got self-interest as Arsenal fans. And it's, it's a shame, mate. We need some real governance, real authority before people start to govern themselves. And when that happens, the game will be fractured. Yeah, I mean, it is, you know... The self-interest thing is really interesting. When you think about someone like uh, Bakayo Saka, for example, James, who, who, you know, if Arsenal were smart, should have left out of the West Ham game mm. and said, look, he's got a hamstring injury. He can't go away uh, on international duty. Come on, Gareth Southgate. You can beat San Marino and Albania and Poland without Bukayo Saka. Like, if you don't win those games, it won't be because you don't have Bukayo Saka. Of course, you know, it will be a benefit to you to have a good player like that, but it's not as if you don't have options available to you. Instead, our, our self interest was the West Ham game, which, you know, I get, I understand, but somebody at some point has to start thinking about what happens to the players because Saka does 74, 75 minutes against West Ham, has to come off with a hamstring injury and now can't go away on international duty or is going to join up late. Uh, and if he does join up, you know, there's no way this this kid is 100% fit. Yeah, I I, I think in, in, in the case of somewhere like England, they do they do get it. And they don't they don't need to to use Saka whenever available. You know, I think that that contrasts with obviously Clive is making the point about Bamiang and the, and then you have someone like like, like Thomas Partey as well. Mm. I think you end up in a really challenging bind if you're uh, Arsenal, if you're the player, where these things mean an awful lot. You want happy players. You want Thomas Partey to to have success with Ghana. You want him to play at the Africa Cup of Nations because that's great for him. But it's clearly not great for Arsenal that in January next year, uh, their most important midfielder, their most important striker, potentially, they could all be you know, off for um, a month, at least a month, depending on how far they get through the tournament. Is it, and is it happening it, in January? It, happening in January. It, it's another... It's another case of, well, AFCON thought about doing it in the summer, but actually it's not in, uh, you know, the African Federation's interest to to have that tournament at the same time as the Euros or the Olympics or whatever the major summer event is. So let's have it. And it's also worth pointing out, often not great for the players to be playing in uh, yeah. an African summer, better to play in an African winter. But, it, but, but, you know, at some stage, I think things like AFCON, Clubs will, we've seen before, clubs uh, make up injuries for their star African players and, and sort of challenge them to to not go. But that, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. It will inevitably seriously damage the international game. And, uh, you know, I think that it's still, that still carries some importance, some luster for the players. Although I do, I do wonder if we get to a stage eventually where, you know, some players just, they stop caring. International duty stops being exciting for them in the way that it's probably stopped being exciting for quite a lot of fans. You see this on on social media. You see that that really people don't experience international football now through how England or Ireland or, or whoever are getting on. They experience it through how, they, how their players are getting on. You know, I think we all saw the the collective gasp when Martin Erdegaard rolled his ankle mm. um, against was it Gibraltar last night. Yeah. And it's, it's a really strange experience that I'm 
you know, personally struggling to get my my head around like what when do these games just stop mattering to everyone? When does do, does it become too much of a risk for Arsenal to say off you go, Martin, you go and play against Gibraltar when Norway don't need you, Bukayo, you go and play against Albania when Gareth Southgate doesn't need you, but because at the same time we know that it will mean a lot to you to play at the European Championships. It is really complicated and I've probably not offered a very coherent point on it because I, I'm struggling to get my head around how this all fits together and how you know there will not be less fi- fixtures in the future. Arsenal, if they're still in Europe, will be playing more European games, whether it's Champions League, mm. Europa League, Europa Conference League or Europa Regional Conference, Wernham Hog, whatever they call the next level down <laughs> so that everyone gets more games and everyone gets more money. And eventually it, it's hard to to escape the sense that you'll just go, mm, sorry, Thomas, we don't want you going to AFCON. We've got a really big game coming up against Liverpool. You can't go. You know, that that is on the horizon. We heard Arteta talking about this when he was talking about not letting players, you know, in the end, it, it's our responsibility. We're not letting players like Partey and Aubameyang go uh, to to red list zones which obviously is a, a unique one off but it, it's changing the way the current situation is changing the way clubs think about letting their players go and I don't think it's going to be easy to put that genie back back in the bottle Clive is there you know whatever whatever uh, some fans might think of international football uh, and perhaps they can easily dismiss it A the players you know, for them, it's a it's a point of pride and, and something they want to do, you know, to play for their countries, to represent their countries, to, um, you know, to appear at European Championships and World Cups and to potentially win those things. And, and we know what a good performance in, you know, a World Cup can do for a player's career. I mean, it made people think El Hadji Juf was a, you know, a, a guy to spend money on way back in the day, you know. So, you know, there is that element of it as well. But are we perhaps going to have to... Um, think about uh, breeding is the wrong word, but creating a generation of football players who are playing basically 11 to 12 months of the year because the fixture calendar, the football calendar is now such that there is no break really from football at all, whether it's preseason friendlies, preseason tours, preseason tournaments, then you've got the the domestic leagues, the international breaks, the European Championships, the World Cup, the Confederations Cup, the African Cup of Nations, you know, the various, the European Super Club, all of those things, um, you know, which mean that players are basically on the go for for the duration of the year. They don't get the rest. So, you know, is it is it is the next step in football being able to like produce these super athletes or is it a case of um, it becoming much more of a squad game so you can provide some rest and, and recuperation to these guys? I realise that's a lot to unpack, so please just tell us the future of football. That's <laughs> an Elliot, Elliot question there. <laughs> so basically, they, they're, they're already super athletes. I was fortunate enough to go and watch Arsenal train and it was quite stunning to me how they looked. When I looked at them, I thought, "Cranky, the sacrifice you've got to make to look like that, on the, you know, the mm. way they, their weight, everything about them was just like physically unbelievable, you know." And there's a huge sacrifice there, and there's a huge uh, physical pressure. But something I often think about, and people don't realise that at the elite level, the mental pressure is just massive. Mm. You know, it's just massive, and we've seen more and more. It's been exposed to us now with social media, etc. But the well-being in football, I, still, I think, is a huge topic. Much of it doesn't come out. You know, there are probably many things that are kept inside about how players struggle with the mental pressure of the game, not just how people critique them about the game. Mm. The general mental pressure of performing under pressure is huge. It's a huge part. And that's the rest they need. You can even see it, you know, you can even see it with goalkeepers. Our goalkeeper's going for a bit of a dodgy spell at the moment. He needs a rest and people say, oh, he doesn't run about Clive. We need a mental rest to freshen him up mm. so he can actually play the ball out properly. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's very important. And um, and we have to create this time within the season now. As athletes, they're already 12-month athlete, athletes because you have to be. You meet footballs on holiday, they're always training. 
they have to train to keep at the levels. It's not like the old days where you come back two stone overweight. Yeah. That can't happen anymore. Run it it's off finished. in pre-season, yeah. <laughs> you really will throw up up the hills and come back and you're there in, in a couple of months. That can't happen anymore. So we talk about elite athletes, but I do think just because you can make an elite athlete run and run and run until he breaks, and we can have the best facilities and the best medical care and the wonderful training grounds, which we know and love, when it comes down to it, there's a mental side as well. And these guys need a rest. And I think sometimes, I mean, let's be honest, we're watching a lot of football at the moment. As soon as Arsenal stops, I do miss it, I must admit. But there's a lot of football. We're watching every game in its slot. And it's mentally draining for fans to keep up with it all. You know? And, yeah. and so imagine what the players are thinking. <laughs> It is tough because, you know, you you turn on and you it, it, you lose track of your week in some ways, you know, because you're used to football being on certain nights and then you all of a sudden turn on a Sunday evening and it's Aston Villa against West Brom and you think, what the fuck is happening here? You know, Sunday night was, well, look, I'm not going to say I was watching Songs of Praise, but you know what I mean? There's that kind of thing going on where the, your your week is bookended by, okay, maybe you got a four o'clock, half four game on a, on a Sunday and that's it. Football is over. Maybe some Spanish football on a Sunday evening but like it is weird and I think uh, the the point about mental fatigue is is a really good one just sticking with you Clive and, and we're going to move on um, to uh, someone James mentioned Martin Odegaard who was playing for for Norway and turned his ankle a little bit came off at half time playing on an artificial pitch um, the Norway coach seems to think that he is going to be all right for the game at the weekend, which is a game against Turkey, which is a game that he's going to need Martin Odegaard for. And this is where it gets a bit interesting, isn't it? Because what he could do as a as a um, as an international coach is manage Martin Odegaard through the next five or six days. That's all he has to worry about, whether it's a painkilling injection or, or whatever it might be. Just get him through, strap him up, get the painkillers in, let him run around. And then the problem becomes one for his club, which of course at the moment is Arsenal because he's on loan with us. But, it, you know, it applies to, to all players. And, and we come back to self-interest and the interest of a manager. His job is to win football matches, regardless of, you know, where he's managing and, and everything else. Uh, it is a difficult balancing act, isn't it, for for fans to try and get their heads around because, like, a manager's job can depend on one result, can depend on one goal, one performance uh, from a player. So it's difficult. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't like it, obviously, when when our players are are at risk, but it's hard to be too critical of international managers if they take a chance that a club manager as well might take when he goes into a big game with a player who's maybe not 100% fit. Yep, it's, it's a tough one, right? But when you see him playing against the mighty Gibraltar, and you've got Erling Haaland out there, probably worth £140 million. Pounds. Mm. It's just, you know, the whole game is not quite where it should be. These games need to mean something. You know, they really do. You can't have that level of player out there playing against guys who are basically part-time. Mm. And then, um, But the risk of injury is similar, you know, so it's not... It's just, it, I just don't feel it can continue for a long time. I'm not sure what's going to happen. But anyway, I'll stop calling Odegaard Odegaard now. I'm going to start calling him Neo now because after his performance at, at <laughs> West Ham, he is basically the one player that every Arsenal fan is. <laughs> he is the one. We are we are tracking his every movement. And if he even runs with a limp, it's a mass a mass Twitter breaks down. Do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Um, it is um, so interesting how players can rise up in our minds go quickly so quickly after a wonderful performance what we saw last week. So. But there's going to be others that come along, you know, as you mentioned Sack already, you know, and there's, there's other players that are going to develop because I think Arsenal are going to start producing international footballers again rather than having footballers that when you come to Arsenal, you don't play for your international team because yeah. your form dips and you come out of the squads. And you know, we've got a young kid there in Odegaard has come to our club on loan and he's been named the Norway captain at 22-23 and he's going to play yeah. every game. And and that's it. and that's it. So we know what's coming in the post, really, didn't we? We do, James. How impressed have you been with with Odegaard and his um, his adaptation? Because you know, one of the things we talk about so often when clubs make signings 
is, well, you know, he's come from abroad. He's going to need six months to get used to English football. And, and that's true in some cases. It really is true. But at the end of the day, it's a game of football on a beautiful pitch. And maybe the weather is a bit warmer than you were used to, or it's a bit colder than you were used to. But ultimately, it's the game you've been playing your whole life. Uh, and I know there are other factors and reasons and off-pitch reasons, you know, language and culture and all those kind of things, which can have an impact on a player and how quickly he settles. But, you know, Odegaard has come in from Real Madrid, having spent time on loan in, in Holland and spent time on loan with Real Sociedad uh, and done well at pretty much every loan club he's come in or, or gone to. So from that perspective, I suppose that might have been something that Edu and Arteta looked at was, you know, how well he does at his loan clubs. But have you been surprised at how, how quickly he has become so influential in this team? Absolutely. I think it's hard. it was hard to look at this loan deal. And, I th- you know, from what I knew of Erdegaard, I think we knew he was probably on a slightly higher level than Dennis Suarez. But that, that <laughs> Dennis Suarez deal, it's not one that you, you kind of forget in a hurry because no. it didn't just have no... It wasn't that it had, he had no tangible impacts on the pitch. It was that also, you know, there were minutes there that could have gone to Saka, that could have gone to Smith Rowe. And you know, it may have, it may not have been the right thing, but it may well have accelerated their development. Or a better, or a better loan signing. Or a better loan signing, which would, but I mean, that's, you know, in the end, you realistically, your avenues for improving in January tend to be sort of the the offcasts of the very best teams, Mm. and not best teams in England because they don't want to strengthen you, they don't want you to to beat them, they don't want you, you know, that's not in their interest. So, you know, I, I, you could see there was a quality player there, but I wasn't. I wasn't super confident he would he would hit the ground running right away. I think what really helps is, and you know, you compare this again to Suarez. There was a clear role that Arsenal knew they needed Erdegaard to play. That they knew Erdegaard knew how to play and played well. Mm. There, there's clear synergies. If you see, you know, if you go back and see what he did at Sociedad, just look at the numbers. He, he loved to drift to the right hand side of the pitch. Well, that's great because uh, you know. Arteta had started using Saka there, really intelligent player. And obviously there's Pepe as well. We haven't seen a huge amount of Erdegaard and Pepe, but actually I really like the two when I'm, I've seen them together. There's some lovely interplay between them. And I think Erdegaard takes up the positions that make Pepe look better. And that, I mean, you know, Clive can speak to the actual on-field stuff better than me, but I think that is a a mark of a really excellent player that he makes those around him look so much better. I, you know, the other, the other worry of course was Smith Rowe. Mm. Yeah. It was natural to think Arsenal have just uncovered a potential number 10 of the future that they built themselves that they, you know, only invested a relatively minimal amount in compared to signing him and that he, he might struggle. But, <laughs> Erdegaard is a really smart player. He knows where to be to give Smith Rowe room to go inside if need be. He also, you know, with Jack and Niren, there was a really interesting in, in the Tottenham game how they, they formed this line of five with Jack stepping up, Erdegaard dropping to the right, Smith Rowe bombing out along the left. Mm. And I think it's it clicks because he's a really intelligent footballer who works incredibly hard off the ball, a pressing demon, um, and who who doesn't seem to have arrived with an ego. It's this thing where the team is is built around him, but it's only built around him because he's the one that will facilitate everyone else looking really good. I, I really like him. I think he's fantastic. It seems from his quotes, he's he's come with the right attitude. He, he has come to develop, to find some stability. Um, and I think it's, it's a credit to, to Arteta and Adu that they got this deal done. Um, who knows what the future will hold. Uh, but I don't think Arsenal should be, you know, I don't think Arsenal should, fans should be too dreary on the prospects of keeping him long term because if you find a club where you can do what Erdegaard is doing, you're going to be keen to stay. I think he, he's going to know that this is a great place for him to to develop over the next three to five years. So I'm I'm really I'm, it's really intriguing what's going to come. I'm looking forward to the summer and the drama of it, but I mean more <laughs> than that, I'm looking forward to seeing him play a lot. Yeah, well, me too. Uh, yeah, I, I can't wait for the summer where people are tracking his planes and his yeah. automo- planes, trains and automobiles, part two, the Arsenal transfer story. You know, um, how, Clive, confident or 
or anything else should we be about um, what's to come? Should we just be focusing on the now? Because, you know, there's part of me, you know, I really, really want him to stay. I, I love watching this player. I can see him in our shirt for years to come. I can see what he brings to the team and and how important he is to the kind of football that Arteta is trying to play. And I think that's, that's an, a really interesting aspect of this for me is that there were times this season even during the during the really bad spell where it was just so hard to understand what exactly it was that Mikel Arteta wanted from his football team what style of play was he trying to implement and you know he didn't for whatever reason and there's no need to relitigate it uh, pick Mesut Ozil he didn't have a, a Fitzsmith road to play there but as soon as he's got a player for this you know nominal 10 position uh, you know who can press who can pass who can shoot who can score who can pop up in the right positions the effect has been transformative it's not all, all down to Odegaard uh, of course because there are other players who've come in Smith Rose come in and Martinelli had a a little boost um, when he first came back into the team but he seems to define the the way that I I think and hope Arteta wants his team to play from now on rather than this sort of muddling through that we did because of issues that may or may or not been of our making that impacted the kind of players that we could pick. Yeah, I think we were restricted massively, and there was a there was a transition turnover in the the main leaders in the squad, particularly the, uh, the attacking mid leaders. We sold a couple, maybe too many, and we had one that was just basically not going to play, was semi retired. So, I think a couple of key moments that maybe caused some of the pre Christmas bad form, and un- and really a lack of identity on the football pitch from an attacking point of view. I think um, losing Smith Rowe to that shoulder injury, I think, was bigger than we realised. Um, knowing that he did really well in training, was maybe going to go and play, then got injured and this three months was lost. And losing Thomas Party for the games that we have lost him, you know, put another mm. 10, 15 more games on him and we are 10 points further up the league with both of them, really. The addition of Odegaard just shows you that the club is getting better because we spoke about Denis Suarez and... I remember that loan deal. There was three players I think we were going to go for. It was Suarez, it was Christopher Nkunku and Yannick Carrasco. We ended yeah. up going for the, the one bloke that really was injured. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then missed out in Champions League by one point. I mean, these sort of mistakes are really, really critical to the future of your club. They're, they're £100 million pound mistakes. That's yeah. what they really are. You know, when it comes down to it, they're not laughing matters. You know, so we're getting better because we've got the best loan player on the market. And he's doing, maybe him and Jesse Lingard, but you know, and um, and they do, and he's doing really, really well. And I feel that with some players, their game personality is so big, they almost define how you play. And people say, well, the coach should have this sorted out by now. But when you've got the right type of players with their specific skills, the game you play is easy. Everyone can see the game he wants to play, so you play it. You defer mm. where you need to, and I, and I think it's just obvious now. And I think. Odegaard has found a club at the right time for him and I think Arsenal have found him at the right time for them and the future of well, how we're going to play is really really clear hence the excitement of a game where we were like the dog and duck for the first 30 minutes and were brilliant for the last hour Yeah, and people can't get that last hour out of their minds well I can't because it was so transformational and there was a period in that game where Odegaard and Party said enough it's time for us to run this team now and they just took over, and I liked what I saw. Well, you know, let's. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about you know our, our chances of, of keeping uh, Odegaard, but I think you know we can have that conversation a little further down the line. Uh, I do feel that a lot depends on on the player himself. Obviously, you know what Real Madrid want to do, what Arsenal want to do. Uh, you know they they might be in the same ballpark, but what the player wants to do and how important he feels will, will be a big part of it. So hopefully Arteta and Edu are, are laying the groundwork there as much as possible to sort of hammer home to this guy how how important he could be. But but Clive, sticking with you and Thomas Partey, um, you know he's gone away on international duty, and part of me was going, oh no. Don't want another player out there risking themselves. But then another part of me, you know, was thinking, you know, maybe he needs the game time because he's missed so much football this season. We saw it in the, um, what was the game 
before the West Ham game at home. The Tottenham game. Yep. That last that, 10 minutes. That little one. That little game <laughs> that I somehow have, have forgotten. But, you know, like basically uh, uh, his batteries fell out. Yeah. Like they're gone. He was like the the opposite of the Duracell bunny. You know, he, he, he hasn't really been able to build the stamina required to play 90 minutes. So I'm wondering if, you know, these games coming up uh, on international duty might go some way to building up that stamina and match fitness and how beneficial that might be between now and the end of the season. Because it strikes me that if he's a guy that we can get playing 90 minutes most of the time, uh, or when we need him to play 90 minutes, I should say, you know, there might be games where we could take him off after 70 minutes and, and the job is done, fingers crossed. But, you know, for him to be able to go 90 minutes, 90 minutes when we need him will be huge. Yeah, his issues for me were all, anaer- all anaerobic issues, all fitness issues. Um, if he was fit, we'd be able to see him a lot more clearly. Um, I think he only had one game, Andrew, because I think one of the games is in South Africa, so I don't think he... Well, I know he can't go there because yeah. of their issues. So um, he has one game in two weeks, so that's enough time for him to have a change of environment, which is good for the, good for the head, mm. but also have enough sort of training time, etc., to do the, the hard work he's got to do. And it's just pre- it is hard, ugly work, pre-season work for him to get back to his levels and but I, I personally think he's a player that's quietly already at his level just recently and mm. um, I think what we have to do as, as Arsenal fans we, we see this big guy down the middle and we have this perception of him that he's going to be a stopper and a you know a defensive mid to physically scare people etc but actually you need to think about it slightly differently and you need to think about a player in your mind like almost like Busquets or Thiago type player and they look different to him, but they play the same way. Disguise passes through the lines, lots of creativity from a deep position, got all the clubs in his bag, go left and right, but it's a sliding for the lines. And to do that, we saw it the weekend really clearly. To do that, you've got to have ability to create the angles in the first place. And that's the sort of thing we haven't had. Shaq is a very, you know, he's a good passer. But he's quite a predictable passer. We can see that left leg swinging out. You know exactly. <laughs> we know exactly where it's going to go. <laughs> it spins out to Tini or it spins out to Saka Rivers or Aubameyang, and it whoosh. There it goes into the one place that he can only go because yeah. his body's built that way. Party's different, and that creativity from deep is how we need to view him. Not so much the you know the what he looks like you know from a physical point of view. Yeah. And that's why I think it's going to dictate his partner needs to be a bit more of a sprinty physical player that can create to allow him to that can stop sorry to allow him to create a little bit more and I do think we need to re-educate ourselves on what he actually could be if you think about him statistically from a Thiago perspective before he sort of messed up this season previously he was the best in, at Bayern Munich think about him in that way mm. I think you'll be able to read him better and understand what he's doing for the team and Odegaard doesn't do what he does at the weekend with that party being there. And I think yeah. that's going to become more and more apparent. He's going to become the link to the top end of our pitch. It is interesting, James, isn't it, to watch him and, and to see a player in midfield where, like Clive says, um, you know, and it's not to be uh, uh, to denigrate him in any way, but you know where, where Xhaka's passes are going. Partey, Ooh. you don't quite know what he's going to do with it. You know, that little inside pass that he makes look really, really simple is hugely effective. I think we scored against, was it Burnley with a pass that he made inside? I think to Willian and Aubameyang ended up scoring the goal until we gave them the, you know, the silly goal just before half time. But, you know, a simple inside pass uh, away from where people are expecting into the kind of space where players can run, uh, what have you, is, is, is really beneficial. I mean, you know, he could, if we're going to finish this season strongly, he's going to have to be a big part of it. He is. It's for me. It's it, you know. Go, I mean, Clive. I think has described it there fantastically. It's it's that Arsenal are getting quick ball. They're getting, and that that has been something that they've been crying out for for a very long time. That the ball, even with a, a Sabios Jacker last season, when they were at their best, Arsenal had to build moves slowly. Uh, you know, it was the twenty five thirty pass move to goal, which which yeah. is brilliant when Aubameyang then goes and curls it in the far corner, and it can certainly be an effective way of beating an opponent. But if that's all you've got, then you are giving your opponent a lot of chances to to sit back and to, to get in position and to just say, oh, can you beat us? Mm. Um, 
Partey gives you he gives you another another way. He he ta- he can take the ball on the half turn and do one of three or four things. As we were saying, Xhaka gets the ball. We know what Xhaka is going to do, uh, and you know, I really enjoy seeing Partey pick up the ball and. You don't know what he's going to do. And I think at the moment, he's probably still at the stage where, you know, he is not yet at a position where his his body can quite do what he knows he has the technical ability to do. So you, you I remember in that last 10 minutes against Spurs, you could still see flashes of the midfielder. You, you know he is, and you know he'll become with a bit more fitness, a bit more game time, and that pre-season. You know, he would, he would beat a man um, still, even in the last 10 minutes. But it was just, it was a little bit more laboured. It was a little bit more awkward than it is mm. when he's been at his best. And I think we have seen that. You know, we saw that. He, I remember him saying against Man United, he felt he was 100%. It was the other game against Wolves as well. Yeah. And, you know, that midfielder does everything in possession really well, really quickly and authoritatively. And that is, that's what the front, the front four need. Whoever they are, they're all going to be more effective with quick ball attacking a defence that isn't set, that isn't, you know, waiting for Erdegaard to try and slip, you know, to, waiting in a position where Arsenal have to get the ball to the 10 and try and slip something cute through. They're just running through the defence at, at pace. He is he is going to be a player on whom Arsenal's season could pivot. You know, he's a, he's a player that could fare really well in the last stages of the Europa League that could dictate the terms of games. I mean, I'm really looking forward to seeing him coming up against whatever ramshackle midfield Liverpool have to put out after their international break, but I'm sure they'll lose three or four key players based on their luck. Fingers um, crossed. He he is going to be, I mean, he is already one of Arsenal's best players. He's going to be something really special. Um, he He's certainly, I think we all had our doubts about investing in the 28, 27, 28 year old. Remember when there were younger options on the market, but he just exudes authority, and that that's something that's been missing from Arsenal's midfield for, for much too long. Um, um, so, you know, on that basis, James, how crucial is finding him the right partner this summer? I mean, yeah, it's... assuming, like, Danny Ceballos is not going to stay, and Mohamed El Neni is, a, you know, if he does stay, is a kind of journeyman squad player, and Granit Xhaka you know, who I think has been decent, you know, over this last period of time after that mistake against Burnley until his next mistake against Burnley. So the, the lesson, of course, is do not let Granit Xhaka play against Burnley. You know, I think he's sort of made it clear that he is our second best midfielder. But the fact that, that Granit Xhaka is our second best midfielder, again, without trying to denigrate the guy, is an issue that we need to solve. Yes, completely. It is going to be hard because... There, there is just a, a widespread assumption that this summer everything will be fine. That you know, it's not that Edu will will sell Torreira. He'll set. He'll just he'll sell Guendouzi. That this will just magically appear. These these buyers for players on not the highest wages at Arsenal. Certainly not in Guendouzi's case. But you know, they're not cheap. Guendouzi's not you know not cheap. Mm. If you're a, a club that is looking to to take a gamble on a, a young midfielder of questionable temperament. If you're a club looking to take a gamble on Torreira, a midfielder that's not played regularly in two two seasons now, or a season and a half, and is struggling to fulfil his potential, what is the market out there for that? Because Arsenal are not are not going to have huge cash reserves to spend. There are other areas that they're going to need to focus on. That they clearly need a new centre forward, at the very least, to you know a younger one to mm. learn from Aubameyang. They probably, if that's the case, if you know. If, they probably may well need another attacker, uh, potentially new right back. I think it's pretty clear that that's an area that needs upgrading. <laughs> Who knows what the centre back situation will be? Yeah. But you know, it, it's going to be. And you know, then you've got to find that that great parte partner, kind of within whatever you can recoup from from sales. It's it's tough. I agree with Clive. It's got to be someone that that is much more of a pure sitter that just wins the ball back, um, which Xhaka just isn't. You know, he, he does a lot of things well, and I, I certainly think there are going to be games where Arsenal will, will need Granit Xhaka next season. But I don't I don't think he's the, he's the one you want to mm. to build your midfield around. Partey plus A, another with 
Martin Erdegaard on loan again in front of them. Okay, now we're talking. Now we've got something we can we can build towards. But I, I, I think it's important from the outset to just remember how how tough this this climate is when you still need to sell players. Yeah, when you still need to sell players that, that you don't that everyone knows you don't want. But you know, and they know why you don't want them. They know that Gwendozi is problematic. They know that. <laughs> the only way to, to to make Lucas Torreira into the set defensive midfielder he could be is to get out the rack and stretch him until he's six foot. <laughs> or play him. I, I don't or, know how you solve that. I don't yeah. know where the market emerges for those two. And yeah. and the same on Nanny. Obviously, one of the, one of those three can maybe stay as, you, as your fourth choice. Um, maybe you have to sort of, I mean, you know, you hope that players like Willock and Nelson and Nketiah drive, get high fees because they're English, they're young, they've got upside and that's part of the academy is is selling players like that. But um, yeah, I, I don't I don't see an easy solution to, to getting that midfield, to getting that quality midfielder. And I don't, I don't see anyone on the market that will... I would be sure would come in and address the problems in Arsenal's midfield. Clive, I, I, there's a whole podcast to do on squad building uh, and upgrades in various positions and all the places that we feel we want the team to get better. But but how high, uh, without you know going into everything else that we need to do, high how high up that priority list is the the part a partner uh, for you? It, it's up there, mate. It's up there and. And the reason why was probably you, you can see it on 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 Sunday. You can see the influence party could have, and that game required. You know, James said it really worked. He, he required quick service. It required passing with of layers, which Shaka doesn't have. That's not a critique of him because he plays every minute of every game, and it's been you know really important to Arsenal, and, and may well be for another year. But there's a mo- there's an evolution happening here technically on that top end of the pitch. And technical players need the ball early, quick, fast, half turn, turn around, do do your thing. They can't have situations when the ball's coming with a with a message on it saying "kick me," right? So mm. it's too long, and then basically everything breaks down. You have set it back, and you you round the horseshoe again. It's just too slow. And so there are players that can that are more agile on the ball, show a little bit more dexterity, and a bit more ambidextrous. Is that the right word? Yeah. <laughs> and I think we need we need that a little bit more. We need the the comfort and the sprinting speed, you know, all the players we're talking about, there's just like a little bit of sprinting speed across the ground to give us security for our fullbacks to disappear, to give us security if people do go through us, we can catch them up again. You know, I think that's very important. When you buy a player like Party, you're buying him at 27 for 45 million pounds, don't just buy him and say, can you fix all our problems, mate? How about buying him and make sure he's got people around him to allow him to be exactly who he is? And it's not Royal of Overs. It's more Tiago than Royal of Overs. Yeah. That makes sense. How long is yeah? How long has that been our problem, though? Can we, if we could just get <sighs> the player who could make this guy, you know, get get the guys around Cesc who could really let him do what what he does, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It feels like uh, you know something we've been looking yeah. for for time we don't immemorial. Invest in people properly. We are investing them, and then we we love them, and when they're about to go, we normally make them captain. <laughs> <laughs> we thought, and that's what we do. We don't invest in them properly by giving them exactly the right people. You're yeah. going to pay them, but give, make you, you know, give them the people around them. You know, it just takes too long. I mean, I was talking about Greg Shackle the other day and wondering what he was. He's been here five years old. And then when you see him play for Switzerland, he plays with a guy called Dennis Zachariah, who, who's had a similar profile to Party. Mm. Funny enough, Shackle's looked better since Party's come in. Yeah. It took us four or five years to work that out. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't. And, you know, and then now we're looking at Shaka saying, you know, can we improve on that? And that's what we should be doing. It's taken too long to work this stuff out. You know, it really has. And there are a few positions in my head. I'm doing that squad building pod in my own mind, Andrew. And, um, but Centre Mid is definitely one of them. Agree, James, centre forward. If we keep Odegaard, fine. We need to get a lefty left back, don't we, to, yeah. to allow Kieran Tierney's legs to not burn off completely. And the right back situation, depending on funds, I, I must say, Karen Chambers was very impressive the other day. And um, maybe there's a situation there where we can sell one of the right backs and actually try to work out for another year and delay that, depending on how much money is around. But I think the other positions are more important. And it's easier for you to find somebody 
to play right back within your squad for the odd game. Yeah. And he needs to find someone to play left back. So um, there's lots of things I'd like to do. I'd like about five or six, if I'm honest. But um, though centre midfield, I think it's very important because it's a, it's a pillar in your team and you have to build around the longest poles in your tent. And I think party is one of those that we need to build around it. All right. Look, um, just sort of finally, a final thing for, for discussion. I'll stick with you, Clive. First and foremost is the, you know, the direction of travel, if you want to call it that. So what we've been doing of late, which, let me just say, does not excuse or wipe out or or make non-existent what came before this season. You know, the November-December thing was dreadful. There's no two ways about it. You can't just not talk about it or not acknowledge it because you don't like it. None of us liked it, but you can't ignore it because it's part of the reason or a very big part of the reason why we are where we are in the table. But, you know, I think it is a season unlike any other because of everything else that's gone on, um, because of the various challenges that that football has faced and because of the challenges that Arsenal have faced as well, you know, um, on an individual basis, we've... We've come out of a, a long-term manager into a guy who didn't really work with a regime that wasn't necessarily set up to to maximise benefit for the football club, um, as far as I'm concerned. And now we're going in a, a different direction with a guy who's very single-minded, as we know. Um, I mean, where are you on the scale of look, we're doing some really good things and the football that we're playing is is good and the character that we're showing is good as we showed against West Ham versus the, well, it's not that much character to go 3-0 down against West Ham and individual errors and, and the things which which keep um, setting us back. You know, the two steps forward, one step back scenario that we're in at this moment in time. Do you, do you feel more encouraged or... Are you sort of tethered to the ground by by the problems that we can't seem to shake? I, I do feel more encouraged. And the reason why, Andrew, is because the issues that we have are incredibly obvious. You know, the, the stupidity around our own box, the mistakes that we make, they are derailing mistakes. They are so obvious to analyse. It's like, oh my goodness, what are you doing? Mm. You know, it's just just from the pure stupidity. Don't belong at the type of club that Arsenal are, and because they're so obvious, they're easy to rectify. Either remove those people, or you up the standards and you change the culture. One of those things. But the things that I think we are doing really, really well are actually quite hard to coach. How we build up our play is really, really elite it's really good so we may be stupid in our own box on occasions but in that middle third from box to box we are doing some really good stuff i mean really inventive triangles and diamonds in wide areas now we've got some centrality we party in odegaard and we'll get into the box we're probably about five or six goals down and we're probably down to our skipper not quite being as hot as he was last year and, mm. and scoring above his XG, which he was doing for the previous calendar year before he signed his contract. So we've lost a few goals there. I'll put it down to him, but it's probably others as well because we missed chances significantly. And so the things to fix are obvious. The things that have been sort of implemented are actually quite hard to do. So defensive structure build up play, pan play, wide areas, having a clear structure there, how we create overloads, how we create superiority to wide areas. Centrality now, we party in Odegaard. We turn, that means we're harder to read now because we're going down both sides and down the middle. We weren't, we're not just a fully left-sided team. So I can see the tactical development and the evolution of this team really clearly. And all our minds now are flipping to the summer. They're flipping to the summer and what can we do to improve the personnel within the way we're playing right now? Can we keep Neo in this team? Can we keep Party fit? Can we get him a partner? And it's all about improving the parts that we can see to make us more consistent. And, and I said this last week, Andrew, about lifting the floor of this team. This team is a 9 out of 10 or a 3 out of 10. And when we're 3 out of 10, we can see three goals. And when we're nine out of ten, we can score three goals in fifteen minutes. I mean, it's it, that that's not sustainable. Mm. You know, we have to have players that turn up week on week and give us a seven out of ten. As soon as they put their shin pads on, I'm a seven. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, that's yeah. where you create a league-winning team 
rather than a cup team, which we which we have been for half a decade at least. James, you know, where are you on this? Are you are you seeing the the green shoots um, in the scorched earth, the salted earth that was <laughs> the season that came before? Um, you know, how, how do you how do you feel? Uh, this team is capable of, of continuing to make progress um, under this manager. Yeah, I, I I think I find it hard to not see the, the green shoots, really. I think if you look at since Christmas, Arsenal are somewhere in the, the you know, somewhere in the mix for the second best team in in the Premier League behind Man City. And there, there is a chasm, you know, there is a chasm that's, that's not going to be bridged mm. in two or three years. I, it, this is a this is a project, and I, I think in the end, throughout all of this, I have always got the sense that Arteta knows what the problems are, and I mean Clive is right that, that some of these problems have been staring successive Arsenal coaches in the face, and they have not. I mean, in, in Emery's case, they haven't felt empowered to fix them. In Wenger's case, I think he just he was too engrossed in everything to get into the granular. Um, Arteta knows what's wrong with this team. Um, Arteta, you know, ha- holds the, the, these players to very, very high standards, and has the backing at the highest level, and has the self-confidence to, you know, hold players to the fire, to, to set standards. You know, we, obviously, it was only a few weeks ago we were talking about Bamiang and um, I still don't know, and I, I still don't know what I think about. You know that that specific case, but I know that it, in totality, having a manager that does not accept anything less than the highest standards on and off the pitch from mm. Arsenal players is clearly going to put Arsenal in the right direction. I, it will. It may well be a much slower road simply because it, you know Arsenal are coming from a lot lower a base than fans might expect and because the last year has re- has slowed everyone down and this mm. i think this season is a bit of a, a freak season it's a season where west ham are competing for the champions league which i love the west ham team but yeah you know, that's that's how we will remember this this will have been the year that west ham nearly uh, you know made the champions league and liverpool fell apart and good things weren't always reflected on the pitch it's a it's a cult you know that it, this is a, a footballing project and a, and a cultural project. And I don't think there were many managers that were willing to come on board and take that cultural bull by the horns and start asking difficult questions of Arsenal players. And I don't, I don't know whether the mistakes we see on the pitch are a reflection of the culture that we've seen for years off the pitch. But it, it makes sense to me that it is. It makes sense to me that a team that, that where the captain kind of still feels like, you know, it's not the end of the world to turn up late before a derby. And, you know, I was in the same traffic jam as the and I have much sympathy for him in that <laughs> instance. But if these things happen, I think that that explains how a team on the pitch can make really basic errors and can just switch off for the first half an hour against West Ham. In the end, Arsenal have given someone sufficient faith in their job that they know that they can take on the biggest people, you know, biggest names in Arsenal. They can drop a Bamiang. They can sideline Ozil and not worry that it might cost mm. results in the short term. And whether, you know, whether it's Arteta or anyone else, just having a manager that is empowered to do that, I think is what Arsenal need. I don't know whether Arteta is Pep 2.0 or whether he's just quite a good coach. I think it's pretty clear he's quite a good coach. You can see that from Arsenal's attacking play. You know, they're, since Christmas, they're scoring two goals a game, they're letting in one. And you need to, you know, you can take a lot of that one out. Yeah. Just improving, as Clive said, improving the floor, getting better defenders, and just upping standards, upping standards on and off the pitch. I think you just, it's just worth persevering because the alternative is to, to dive back into that into that maelstrom again. And it has been such a self-defeating few years for Arsenal. You know, Gazidis going, Farmy going, Sanye going. Just not sacking the manager, not moving on, not, you know, blowing everything up seems like the most helpful thing you can do right now. 
just stick with a plan and give the people that you want to execute that plan the time, ideally the money, who knows, but the time to, to just work on it. Right now, it's heading in the right direction. It's heading slower than Arsenal fans would like. It's still 10th in the Premier League, which is nowhere near good enough. Ninth, ninth. Ninth? ninth. Yep. Sorry. Sorry, come on, James. The notifications are 10th <laughs> in the league. Um, but it, it's not going to get better if you blow everything up. But that's it. You have to give it a chance to work. I mean, it's not that, the, you know, you can't make the case that everything is perfect. No way. And, and you know, there's the argument that, like, if the if the problems are so obvious, why can't you fix them? Uh, which is, you know, what critics might say. But I do uh, tend to side with you guys that I think, at the very least, you have to give this plan uh, time uh, and more time to develop and come to fruition and... Uh, you know, culture change is a very ephemeral kind of thing to to implement, and it's difficult sometimes to see, you know, what a manager or what a coach might be doing in that regard. But you know, you point to the Ozil thing, you point to the um, the Aubameyang thing, big brave decisions which don't make him popular. You know, so at least there's a bravery there to make unpopular decisions. Some of them um, much less popular than than you know some of us would like in terms of his team selections. But you know, we'll see. And there's still obviously Clive, uh, you know, something big, big, big to play for this season. When you look at the Europa League draw, and I'm not taking anything for granted. I don't think any one of us, having watched Arsenal, you know, this season or any other season, could take anything for granted you just can't do it you know you think about the 2014 uh, FA Cup and you're going Wigan in the semi-final and then you know it, I can't remember who it was it was like one of Hull or somebody else in the semi-final I can't remember who it was but it was it wasn't a big name and you're thinking well Jesus it's set up here perfectly for us to win and we came within eight minutes of going out in the semi-final and we were 2-0 down in 10 minutes in the fucking cup final so look we all know what this club is is capable of doing and doing to itself. But there is still something huge to play for, a European trophy and like a VIP pass. You know, like walking into the nightclub and somebody's handing you, uh, you know, the, the key to the VIP elevator. Up you go and all the stars are there and you're in the Champions League next season and it just changes everything even just for 12 months to allow you to build and and bring in players and and use that money for the benefit of of the team like someone needs to let us behind the velvet rope right? exactly so into, into the vip section i say in, in my mind you know arteta has been hired as a three to five year coach and and we're going to give him like two years minimum maybe three to get this place in shape and if we win the Europa League there you go I've said it if we win the Europa League that takes a year off the project right it, it really does at a time when every club's going to lose £100 million there's no fans in the ground we're not sure what attendance is going to look like next year we hope they're going to be much better than obviously this year given the vaccine situation etc but revenues are not fully guaranteed so if you can shortcut the project by being in the top league and add this 60, 70, 80 million back into your into your pot, then you can start to speculate on signings. And mm. it's an incredible, incredibly important time. It really is and such an important time for the club. And we can't afford to have situations off the pitch. We can't, and our experienced players bringing dramas to the show because this is really important. And I think... I do think that we are built for this type of before, you know, Europa League performance. We're built, we're built cup for team. a cup team. Yeah. We are built this way. We can lift ourselves. We've seen it. You know, all apart from Man City, we've beaten everybody else. Right? We've seen it, uh, apart from Wolves and Aston Villa. <laughs> we beat everybody <laughs> else. And, well, um, we beat Man City so, in the semi-final last year as well. So. Oh, we did. Thank yeah. you. You reminded me of that. It was no fans. I wasn't there. So I missed it. <laughs> but, like, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. So we know we can lift to those high levels on a one-off situation, and the team is, is, is wired for that. We need to wire in the league stuff, what I said earlier, but it's wired for that. And I, I, I'm not one of those that thinks we need to be in Europe next year unless we can win the Europa League, because I think the guy needs time to bring in new players, bring them into the squad, assimilate them, settle them down. But I recognise the financial value of being in Europe. I recognise the sporting value of Arsenal Football Club being in Europe. I think it's incredibly important. The Champions League deal, current deal, I think it's 23-24 season, it changes. 
They're already jockeying for changing the format of the Champions League. There's going to be the threat of the Super League. And while this is all happening, I feel it's incredibly important that Arsenal are positioned at the top table to be there, to accept the change, to be at the forefront of any change and be rewarded by being at the top level with being in the where the money is, basically. And I think what we're doing now is, is critical to building foundations for where we need to be in two, three years' time. I'm afraid as fans, it's hard to say wait because we've waited a long time. We've looked around London, people building grounds and winning trophies at Chelsea, etc. And they're doing what we did 10, 15 years ago. And it's hard to say wait. But I do feel that this current regime, the problem statement is understood. They're heading in the right direction and the horizon looks better than the recent past. All right. Well, look, we'll see where it brings us. Still plenty to play for this season, of course, uh, as I said, with Europa League and and still some Premier League points to be gained. But we'll leave it there for now, as ever. Great to talk to you both. Uh, Clive, thanks a million. Thank you very much. And James, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed to the chaps. You can find them on Twitter. James is at James Benj, at James Benj, and Clive at Clive P A F C. And you can hear him, of course, on the Arsenal Vision podcast. Right. As it's the interlull and there's not much else going on, uh, we're going to leave it there for this week's show. If you want a bit more to listen to, there is a new episode of Waffle for Patreon members. It's the podcast in which myself and James talk about anything and everything except Arsenal questions put to us by Patreon members. You can listen to that. You can also watch the video of that podcast as well. You can sign up if you're not already a member at patreon.com forward slash arsblog. And remember that your support there helps us do everything we do on the site from the youth to coverage of the women's team and these podcasts and everything else Uh, so if you fancy it patreon.com forward slash arsebog if you don't don't worry about it it's a pleasure to have you here as always thank you very much indeed for listening like I said at the top I hope you and yours are keeping safe and well uh, doing the best you can and uh, long may it continue that way right James and I will be here on Monday with an Arsecast Extra so until then have yourselves a great weekend catch you on the next one. Cheers. Bye-bye. Welcome back to Sky Sports News for the latest from the World Cup of Death. We go to our reporter, Bob Surface Cleaner. Thank you, and it's good news for England. In the semi-final between Harry Kane and Kylian Mbappe, the England man came out on top after a scintillating battle. Mbappe struck first, leaving the England man absolutely bewildered after his trademark Billy Wiz move. But Kane responded with a British Bulldog, covering his opponent in drool and leaving him absolutely drenched. Then, thanks to the dorsal fin that he grew after the great meltdown in 2024, his signature move of backing into the opponent saw Mbappe disemboweled. His guts were everywhere. Kane was delighted. A nation rejoiced. England manager Sam Allardyce said... So, England are in the final. All eyes now turn to the second semi-final between solid gold Ronaldo and robot Lewandowski. Thank you, Bob. Coming up next on Sky Sports News, Matt Letizia is here in studio to tell us why he thinks Arsene Wenger was behind the moon landing.